Our uh, data services that are of uh, big interest and value for cities. So consider, for example, uh, as a case of the integration of a public transportation system uh, with a private ride-sharing service. So from a rider's perspective, uh, we want a seamless system, if I enter the bus, get off the bus, uh, a Uber or a different service waiting for me, they are already. But from the governance side, this is actually a very tricky example. Uh, so if you think about the city who has uh, perhaps an open data policy, that all data needs to be made public, uh, but for the ride-sharing company, uh, this uh, data is a very valuable asset. So this, this question of uh, data integration and data governance is a, is a central uh, part of uh, also what we are uh, going to deal with here. So in this session, we will have uh, examples from different cities. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, uh, Prague, Barcelona, uh, Bristol, London in the UK. Um, and uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, the case studies uh, in these cities. Uh, and I wanted to uh, introduce our first speaker, Markus Wiesmann from Cisco, uh, who will present the framework uh, on, on urban data management. Uh, he has been with Cisco for more than nine years, and uh, he, is, uh, he runs Cisco's Smart and Connected Cities business initiative across Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Russia, um, with uh, a number of uh, key urbanization engagements. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Markus. Uh, can, we, can we have the slides uh, for Mr. Wisman? Right? Mm. Okay. No, not yet. Anyways, uh, by the time he finds out the slide. So, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for, for having us. It's a pleasure for us to be here. It's an honor. Um, we talk a lot about uh, smart cities. We have been uh, doing smart and connected communities uh, since the last 10 years now. And uh, the Internet of Things really helped a lot uh, evolving and making this a reality. So, if you look Today at the Internet of Things, we crossed the chasm, I think, three years ago already. We have, in the next 10 to 15 years, 50 billions of devices connected to the Internet. And uh, we, this Internet of Things is really now evolving into the Internet of Everything. So you connect not just data, things, and uh, the process, but also you add the people to it, the citizens. And this is basically um, what we also see in cities happening. How, what does it mean for a city, the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things? How does a city deal with that? In most of the cases, when uh, we look into, next slide please, when we look into smart cities, we, we have a, a reference model which has been adopted actually by cities um, today already. You, get, you will hear uh, a few examples from, from Barcelona, how they did this, but um, showing you the slide on, on the reference model, it gives you a clear indication how a data-driven city could look like. So you have actually on this slide, it's, it's, I know it's a busy slide, but let me just uh, highlight you what this means. So you have three layers. You have the street layer at the bottom. Here you connect actually all your things, sensors, whether this is video-based or just regular sensors, audio-based sensors whatsoever. This is happening on the street layer with you know, whatever asset you want to like to connect. In the middle, you have the so-called data center layer. What, ha what happens in the data center layer is analyzing of data. So basically, if you have your parking spot connected with a sensor, this information goes into the data center. It's being analyzed, correlated maybe also with, with other data you are collecting, and then creating the urban services on top of it so that the citizen actually can find the free parking spot um, he, in, 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 the, in the location he's going to. Um, the most interesting part of this is, is that you can start, if you have a common integrated platform like this, you can start to fuse the data, to correlate the data. So the biggest challenge we have nowadays in cities is that cities are thinking in silos. And this is actually not good for this model. So <clears throat> we advise the cities to look 
into a horizontal layer on top of all different departments of the city, create a one-time investment for such a model so that you don't duplicate investments in your different agencies. If you have done this this way and you have this ref reference model in mind, you can actually generate a lot of data for sure with these Internet of Things, but at the same time, you are able to create new urban services which are running on top of your platform. And uh, Barcelona will give an example on how they have used this reference model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Anthony Vives, who will talk more about uh, Barcelona uh, application and uh, collaboration with Cisco. Uh, Mr. Vives is the former vice mayor of Barcelona, and he's the chairman and CEO of the City Transformation Agency. Uh, so he was engaged uh, in the implementation and the development uh, of uh, uh, this kind of smart city uh, implementation and uh, data control. Uh, so currently, Anthony is developing its own project, the Company City Transformation Agency, which advises cities and governments uh, across the world. Uh, Mr. Vives, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thanks to the organization for uh, uh, having invited us to come to Moscow. It's always a pleasure coming to th this gorgeous city. Moscow deserves to be better known in the world. This is something that I, I know that there are some city officials here and some Moscovites. You have to be proud of your city and you should be showing it off much more than you do. But because each time that we come here, we have the experience of being in a real city, a city with a capital C. So uh, congratulations and thank you. Two or three ideas, very, very quickly. I don't know if I have, I have something. Keep pausing, I'm sorry. Let's see if it works. Um, very, very quickly. I'm going to jump these slides. Um, these slides talk about what, this is very interesting. First of all, do not trust the over planners. There are people that are going to come to you saying, I know how to solve the city, uh, and they produce these kind of things. Don't trust them. But do not trust the guys that come to you and say, do not trust the planners, because then they produce these horrible things. So uh, the thing is that we live in a world of data. We know it, and we, know we, we have to be able to apply this data to real life. And real life is not attached to utilities. Utilities are, I mean, the real goal of our uh, job, uh, when you are a politician, the real goal of the consultants is improving people's life. How do we generate opportunities? How do we make people live better? How do we enhance the community sense? And for the first time in history, Data provide us with a solution for the specific problem that a single person has, and for the first time, data puts together in the single moment all the problems as if it were a single one. So those budgetary problems that we usually face when we are in government, so how do we plan, it is already solved. The problem is that most of city officials are not ready for that. So you know Cisco, what Cisco needs, what Microsoft needs, what uh, uh, City Transformation Agency, or for my, my partners here in Moscow, city makers need, is good clients. So mayors, city officials have to get used to work with big data. And the problem that we have to face in the world is how do we make these people become good clients. And to be that, I'm going to go well, this is, I'm very sorry because this is a very interesting movie. One day or another, I'm going to pass it to you. This is the first film of a city in history. This is Berlin 1900. And even though you, can, you don't see it very well in here, if you look at the picture, and this is a movie, you will see a train, you will see light, you will see the same city that we have right now. Well, now we are perhaps more handsome, uh, but the, the difference is known. The question that we have to put is, how is technology changing our life? And is it changing it for the better? And the answer is here. I'm going to go very quickly. The answer is in this slide. You, uh, you know, I made a very nice presentation, which I'm going to jump. Isn't it the next one? No, there, there is another slide. I'm going to use this one. There's another slide in which I ask one thing. Do these people go to the school that they want to go? Do these people feed themselves as they want to be fed? Do these people have the social care that they need? Do these people have their social 
uh, needs being covered by uh, the um, by the administration as they have to, and the answer is in data. The answer is in the way we put data together, and the answer is, uh, as Marco said very well before, in the kind of organization that we have. We have to generate organizations without silos. We have to generate what we call the urban habitat unit in which you merge uh, water management, sewage management, housing, mobility, all under a single commandment, all under a single vision. Big data provides you with that capability. These guys are going to see their needs being covered. This is the message I want to throw to you today, and we can discuss about it later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, in our rapid succession, we are moving uh, now a little bit to the northeast uh, from Barcelona to Prague and going to talk about uh, collaboration between the city of Prague and, uh, uh, and Fraunhofer uh, Institute in uh, the area of city urban, uh, smart cities urban governance. Uh, as a first speaker from, uh, yes, the clicker, thank you, <laughs> uh, from Fraunhofer, I wanted to introduce Petra Suska. Uh, he's a project manager of the city's smart cities urban governance innovation uh, initiative. Uh, he studied uh, economics at the London School of Economics uh, and uh, worked uh, as, a, uh, as a developer in Prague uh, as a strategic project manager. Uh, yeah, please welcome uh, Petra Suska. Um, hello, can you hear me? I'd like to uh, really uh, thank the, the Moscow government for organizing this event uh, and uh, I think it's really amazing. I have to uh, really thank them for, for drawing such a massive crowd of people and it's amazing how many people are interested in the, in the future of cities and sustainable development. Um, I'm here on, on behalf of Fraunhofer and you may know it as the inventor of the MP3 file uh, among other things, uh, but uh, we have a, a wide range, range of portfolio of, of activities and one of them is, uh, is Smart City and, and that's, uh, that's uh, what I do for a living. Um, now we go to various cities around the world and, and um, apply this uh, concept called the Morgenstadt, which is the city of the future concept that we've invented in 2011. And it basically looks at uh, a city and, and proposes a more of a horizontal type of management that uh, uh, the representative of Cisco mentioned. And, and we've noticed uh, a pattern and, and, uh, with regards to data, uh, collection and inter interpretation. Uh, the first is, and this is the non-smart uh, approach, it's the vertical data interpretation, which really um, emphasizes the silo uh, division of departments and the lack of, uh, the lack of their collaboration, and it does not enable the provision of, of smart uh, services. The other one, the most common one, is a, is a, is a cross uh, check of, of, of a horizontal and vertical uh, approach of, of providing uh, and, and collecting data and services. Uh, and it enables the cities to, to, to connect you know, waste management and, and street lights and, 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 um, and, and provide smarter solutions. But what we'd like to see in the future is, is collecting data in, in such a way and analyzing them in such a way that will enable uh, the provision of completely new services that may, maybe we haven't thought about yet. Um, so that's maybe something we could discuss later. I was asked to, to provide two, uh, two examples of best practices. I'll really uh, skim through them. One of them is uh, Guadalajara, which uses um, a data uh, analysis to uh, streamline their finances, to basically uh, um, make the provision of their services more cost effective. It also uh, evaluates the, the impact of uh, you know, uh, the, the public money that's spent uh, with regards to uh, social and, and economic impact. The other one is in Ludwigsburg, which is just north of Stuttgart. Uh, that's where I come from. Um, and uh, they have uh, 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 their data uh, management uh, to, to really help their service be more, more transparent uh, and more approachable. Uh, they, for example, um, visualize their uh, city planning and, and, and master planning changes, uh, and it really helps uh, the citizen to be in very close contact with the city government. Um, and, and, and this is uh, my office. Uh, it's, uh, we call this the micro... Um, urban showcase. It's, uh, it has no air conditioning. Uh, it's completely self-cooling. Um, it, uh, it one, it's one of the greenest buildings, I think, in Germany. Um, and we, we try to test on ourselves uh, the future of the world uh, in 15 years. Um, and so basi basically, um, we, 
we, we have these very smart things around the world, uh, uh, you know, benches that uh, are solar powered and charge your phones and sidewalks that uh, light themselves up uh, and don't, they don't, you don't need a, a, a street uh, lamppost. Uh, lampposts which have Wi-Fi, I mean, these aren't um, uh, crazy inventions, but they work and, and, and we hope to see more of them in, in cities uh, um, of tomorrow and, 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 you know, that will he help us to be more connected and, uh, and more streamlined. So um, thank you for, for, for your attention and then um, we'll be able to answer some questions later on. Thank you. So uh, our next speaker also uh, on, on the other side of the panel um, is uh, Adam Pagert. He is uh, the strategy and development specialist uh, at the Institute for Planning and Development in Prague. Uh, he is part of the team that is currently updating uh, the strategic plan of Prague and uh, coordinates a number of pilot projects in the Smart City Agenda. Um, please, Mr. Pagert. Good afternoon to you all. Thank, uh, thank you very much uh, also from my side for having us. Uh, it's been amazingly inspirational. So, so first time for both of us to be in Moscow and to, to take it all in. It's, it's very, very impressive. So uh, uh, I think a lot of inspiration that we will be happy to carry back back uh, to Prague. I, I think I will try to present... Uh, <laughs> I don't know where to point the... Ah. Okay, uh, I will try to briefly present maybe uh, the other side, the side of the city, how we are, the city of Prague, the capital of Czech Republic, trying to figure out what this all means, this, this new potential, this, this amazing technology that suddenly we have on our hands and how do we really feel about uh, finding our sp uh, spot in this. I think, I think because of the limited time, I think I have like three lessons learned uh, that we can uh, sort of uh, uh, pass around at this point. I think first of all, uh, I would encourage other cities or, or other uh, institutions uh, around the world uh, uh, to not be afraid to look at the city uh, from uh, wider context, maybe from, from the outside. We have had a, quite a successful cooperation with Fraunhofer Institute that was able to sort of provide uh, the perspective. Sometimes I think cities and Prague is definitely also uh, you know, possible to, to blame for it, uh, are like the frog who is boiling slowly, 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 and it does not realize it's being boiled until it actually is dead. And I, and I think we need to constantly remind ourselves where we are at, we need to constantly have the finger on our pulse and sort of gather the, the data, consult it, but also verify uh, the ways we gather data, what kind of benchmarks uh, we are comparing it with, what kind of indicators we follow. So I think uh, this is important. Secondly, I think what we have done with Fraunhofer and I, what you see on the slide is sort of uh, analytical uh, view on the on the city which Fraunhofer has provided uh, that looks at different sectors and, and compares it to other cities uh, around the world is that we you know, uh, feel that each city is unique, each city has different problems, each city has different potentials, and you have to look at the DNA of the city. Not all solutions are transferable, not all technology should be implemented just for, you know, the, the nice to have sort of a, a, a um, um, nice to have presentation, but more more, more so, the most so, you have to look at the actual problems and for the solutions that this technology can provide. So I think that's that's very important, not to take in products, but to speak to companies and and try to explain them what the problem is, what you would like to see uh, uh, as your as your strength. So this is a, I think, a successful uh, cooperation and the two solutions among many that uh, deal directly with data are smartification of the city center. Prague has a very historical center, overcrowded with tourists, and we hope that uh, smart applications, smart linings, smart uh, bins could uh, bring back the quality and sort of diverse the tourists in the center so it's not overcrowded uh, like it is at the point. And, and I think that the, the right, the solution at the very right, I think is the sort of precondition for all the other developments, and that is one data analytical center that basically means uh, like uh, my previous colleagues have mentioned, one single point in the city where you gather the data, but you also look at it continuously, you analyze it, and, and you constantly ask yourselves, what does it mean for the city? What are the trends? Where does the city move to? Uh, it means the data 
in the sort of silo world of the city, the city which is fragmented, where you have different organizations that develop the city, uh, give access uh, to the data, and uh, you really uh, look at it closely. Uh, other lesson learned, I think, is the benefit of opening data. Uh, not only providing the data that you first have to gather, uh, then you have to sort of analyze it and provide it to the decision makers, but is to, once you have the data, you might not have the ability or the staff or the power or the finance or the resources to analyze it uh, in the scope that the city would need. Well, you can uh, offer it to, to the private sector. You can offer it to the startup sector. You can stimulate innovations. And uh, what you see uh, at number one uh, is just, and number two is one of the hackathons that we have had in Prague that came up with solutions uh, like uh, like an app, for instance, for, for uh, it could be a, a small thing, but uh, uh, like one of the colleagues today mentioned, the, the small things would be the, the biggest uh, uh, difference that the citizen feels. Uh, this app sort of mapped uh, the spaces in kindergarten. So you live in a specific part of the city, you look at an app and you see what kind of kindergartens in your area have a, uh, a space for your kids. So I think this was quite, quite uh, uh, successful and was a direct result of such a hackathon. Uh, number three, you see uh, this, uh, this site that we are running for about uh, uh, almost a year now as an initiative that uh, came about last year and we are piloting this open data project and we are trying to pursue all the city organization to put as much data sets as possible and uh, the first uh, results, the first fruits uh, of this openness are coming about uh, because at the end of the day uh, the overall aim is a more effective city and a larger quality of life for the citizens. So I think this uh, uh, seemed to be that way. Uh, we, we also have uh, not necessarily direct results of the hackathons, but number uh, five and six are um, um, uh, basically Internet of Things applications, smart bins, and uh, smart parking, which tremendously uh, helped uh, in different uh, parts of Prague to uh, bring the quality back. My, my, my last slide, I think, uh, could be, uh, or has already been said, this is the part where uh, we have uh, basically s said that geospatial data are essential. To know the, 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 the number one basically shows you all kinds of data about pollution, about heat waves, about um, uh, demographics, but it shows you with great detail which, which part of Prague uh, is more polluted or has a larger noise or a larger uh, heat temperature throughout the year and also uh, gives you opportunity to work with, to, to implement it in your uh, goals, in, your, in the way you deal with public space, in the way you set up uh, transportation um, um, schedules uh, and sort of uh, that thing. Uh, 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 and number two basically shows, which is a normally video, we didn't have time to play this, but it shows you, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a finding analysis we did last year with the mobile phone operators, and it shows you uh, where we measured uh, through the GSM uh, SIM cards what kind of people, are there residents, are they coming from out of the city, are there uh, tourists, are there older people, where do they go, what kind of transport do they use, what is the uh, end goal of their visit. So also extremely important uh, information we gathered. And I think my last, uh, my last contribution is uh, number three, which shows you that the city can improve by gathering and analyzing data. There are services, but it can also improve the way it works with resources and management. And this shows you uh, the commodities uh, the commodities, the buildings the city has, and it compares uh, the price for it, uh, the city rents uh, its buildings with the uh, commercial rents that are in the location. So you can see very easily in which location the city is a good manager and which uh, locations the city uh, is actually a very bad manager. So that's just maybe a, a small taste of how we as a Prague are trying to deal with this uh, new opportunities and uh, thank you very much for having the opportunity to share it with you. Thank you very much. So we already see some patterns, some common architectures of uh, you know, models of vertical integration and cross correlation, but then also uh, attempts to basically have a completely exploratory horizontal um, treatment and trying to find patterns uh, in, in public data sets. And we will talk about those different models later again in the uh, discussion, also talking about some of the obstacles that exist there. Uh, as our next speaker, I wanted to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Alex Rotlesley, who uh, works for Geovation Hub uh, in the UK. 
uh, is a, um, a, a service provider, a company who uh, helps cities across the UK solve uh, geospatial problems and uh, provides uh, base data for geospatial data sets. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so very quickly, just to give you an idea of what Geovation does. Um, we are part of the National Mapping Agency of the United Kingdom and Great Britain. So what we do is we're responsible for looking after all the accurate location data for every physical feature in the country. And then what we look at is how we communicate that data into um, the market, into businesses, into government, into cities, and how they can use that. So we set up Geovation as a way to um, bring that data together and bring particularly our open data products, like Adam was talking to, into the market. Open data is absolutely critical to um, making these strategies become real. Keeping data in their own silos, in their own section, it's never going to work. And interestingly, as an organization, we have premium data sets that we um, share with, with governments and, uh, and companies at, for, for paid services. But importantly, since 2010, the UK government has released lots and lots and lots and lots of data to be openly used. And our, our facility is a place where you can actually get support to build that stuff. Because we believe that the, the common thread here um, between all these interesting data sources is place. Um, cities fundamentally are physical environments. And coming back to our citizens on the ground, on the ground you know, if you don't know where things are and where they are going to be tomorrow and the day after, if you can't track change in your physical environment, then you're going to really struggle to to bring these diverse data sets together. And I think that's something we haven't seen much discussion about today, which is how important that is. You can have the most amazing data sets available to you, but if you don't know what those data sets relate to in a really granular way, then you're gonna really struggle. So a couple of examples of projects we're working on. We're working with Cisco on a project in Manchester right now to look at a, a 10 million pound government funded project to explore how to integrate the perfect, if you like, smart city environment, taking the work Cisco has been leading for, for years in this space, but making it in a deployable structure, something you can actually take from one place and drop elsewhere. Um, and I talked about two particular products that we think are really interesting that we're working with, examples of that. Um, one of those is a startup we support called Open Capacity. And if that's going to work. So these guys are using um, open data from us, open data from the transport operators to predict and analyze in real time the capacity of uh, transport networks, and particularly rail networks in London and the southeast of England. Now this is really this is about changing people's lives. Anyone who's commuted into a city knows how real time stress on systems makes people's lives unpleasant and uncomfortable. And data can solve those problems. And we can provide real time feedback to train operators to make sure that they can amend their plans put different trains on, respond to external events like weather events, and it all happens in real time. The second example I'm going to talk about is an interesting one about the importance of, uh, of data that's granular. We've talked about how we get broad trends, you know, how can we see things that are happening from a city management point of view, but what can you do on a very specific um, product and how can data help solve specific problems? So this is a project we're working on um, with uh, a professor of urban design in London, um, looking at the housing challenges of a city like London. We are seven million people. We're going to be growing to eight or nine million people in the next five, ten years. Um, and this is what's happening. People are building sheds in their garden and, and housing people there. Mm. That's not good. So what can we do? Because we have this really detailed data set, we have every building, every footprint of every property in the UK, not just from a, um, a reference point of view for knowing where they are, but for the legal documentation. We know precisely each one of these units belongs to somebody, an organization or individual. And we can use the data to analyze which plots are suitable for which kinds of development, and then provide the city authorities the chance to say not just we'd like to do something, but actually, if you're in one of those red properties, we can give you permission to build in a certain way and increase the housing density in that plot. So this is taking data and strategy and, and policy and saying, not just that the data can give you guidance, it can actually give you a policy framework to make interventions in your city structures. And we believe this strategy can potentially increase the housing stock in London by 200,000 units. That's uh, been briefed into the new mayor of London recently. So it's, it's really meaningful how geospatial data can actually um, drive not just broad insight, but specific change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the topic of informality is...
um, is, is, is also very important and very, very interesting in how to deal with situations and cases where you know scarce data is available about a, a messy situation that is very difficult to describe. Uh, we have a number, of course, uh, there are many cities uh, in Europe and uh, worldwide that are currently experimenting with these platforms. Uh, as an next speaker, uh, we have uh, uh, Alexei uh, Yershov from IBM who will give a brief overview uh, over uh, other examples from Lyon, Madrid and other cities. Please welcome Mr. Yershov. Can you we need the, yes. yes. Can I switch my, thank you. So we have Anthony from Barcelona here and uh, I live in Madrid. I'm fortunate enough to live in Madrid for three years. This is where IBM has uh, European headquarters. It's a bad choice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm excused because I do go to Barcelona often. Uh, so first city I want to talk about is Madrid. Um, every mayor around the world I meet agrees on one thing, that they're paying too much for the city services and they're not getting enough control over the quality. So Madrid decided to do something about it and we helped them build the, the data information platform ar around it. So before city service providers, uh, street cleaning, garbage collection, take uh, maintenance of parks, playgrounds, these providers were paid for activities. How many trucks, how many people I get deployed on the street. Now city says, we don't care how you do that. Uh, we're going to write long contracts with service level agreements and with uh, key performance indicators. Uh, and uh, we're going to pay you for quality. Uh, so now, uh, it, it, this data platform handles uh, all of these activities. So for example, uh, if I'm playing with my kids in the playground, I have four kids, I see uh, swings broken, I have an app, take picture, it knows my, my GPS location, uh, the request goes into the system. Then um, city inspectors, city government employees go around the city and conduct 1500 daily inspections every day with special tablet, uh, with special app uh, built for that purpose. They take a picture if they see a problem, they know GPS location, they report the problem. So they track 300 KPIs uh, based on that. Uh, city saves 6% on physical city services, which is a lot of money. Um, it saves also 20% on, on IT. Uh, suppliers are not squeezed as well because suppliers uh, were moved to longer term contracts. They now have incentives to innovate and optimize their resources. So, so now they're optimizing track roads, for example, they're, they're installing sensors into the garbage bins, so they're optimizing their own operations and uh, this efficiency then share between the city and the, and the suppliers. Uh, so this is, next example I want to move to uh, Brazil. Um, Eduardo Paes is the young energetic uh, mayor of Rio, so he was uh, elected when he wasn't quite 40 yet, and he faced very serious problems. Uh, so uh, after his first year in the office, uh, it was a terrible event uh, with torrential rains and floods and landslides. Uh, 68 people died and uh, he concluded that the city wasn't ready for that. Uh, government agencies' response was not coordinated. They didn't have hyper-local weather prediction. So the city wasn't ready, so he called IBM to, um, to start building the operation center. So let's run the video. Like 
and third example I want to give uh, is moving to Indonesia, to Bandung, a little city, 2.5 million people, uh, capital of Indonesia's West Java province. Uh, they elected uh, another charismatic uh, mayor, Ridwan Kamil, who is an architect by training, uh, and he's an avid user of social media, so he has 1.33 million uh, tw Twitter followers. And at first he told citizens, just report to me problems through Twitter, through email, and uh, they did, and he got quickly overwhelmed, called IBM to build something serious to, to, uh, to manage the city. So we started with um, uh, traffic incident management center, and we kept adding layers, including social media analytics, uh, to build uh, the full-fledged uh, uh, command center for the city. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover today. Hey, thank you very much. So we stay uh, in the international space. Also, we stay with the topic of severe uh, infrastructural questions and challenges that can be addressed uh, with data. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Katja Schechtner. Uh, she's an uh, expert uh, um, researcher at the MIT Media Lab and uh, works with the Asian Development Bank in Manila. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, some of the data uh, initiatives in uh, the Philippines and uh, other countries. Thank you, Dietmar. And thank you all for coming. And thank you very much, Evgeny, for inviting me uh, on behalf of the Moscow government. I'm working for the Media Lab, so you can call me a technologist. But I am here to ruin the party. Because I challenge that we live in a data-rich world. And I challenge that just by implementing fantastic new ideas about technology, services, data integration. I think we are essentially blindfolded when we look at cities across the world. To show you an example, I invite you to come with me to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. It's a fantastic, it's a lively city, but they have a problem, a transport problem, as we have heard so many times today. So they have millions of people who need to go from A to B, and what they have is this poor policeman standing in the middle of a crossing trying to stem the flood and make the others come and go and you know, move around the city. Of course, he doesn't see his other fellow policemen on other crossings. So the flow is, is constantly stemmed. You cannot look around. So what happens? An international technology provider with a long pedigree comes in. He brings with him someone who's really interested in helping, an international development bank who provides the money and funding. And they go and work with the government and they come up with a solution. The solution is we will put traffic lights, just simple traffic lights on every crossing and we will put sensors under the streets. We will put just sensors time-tested sensors, we will link them up, we will wire everything wisely, we will put it to a traffic management control center, okay? And then the, the traffic flow, you can have green waves, everything will work smo smoothly. They do that. They use a few million dollars in Vietnam. They come in, they dig up the streets. Not fun while you're living while well, they dig up the streets. They wire everything together, they put everything there, and then the day comes when they push the button. And this is what happened. <laughs> Complete and utter chaos. Now, why is this? Now, that's very simple. All the engineers that came in were white men. And they looked at the streets of Vietnam, and they saw that whole of Vietnam is moving in scooters, on two wheelers, and motorbikes. But you know what? They didn't believe it. So they put in sensors, time-tested sensors, loop sensors, magnetic field sensors that can only count cars. So the system works perfectly. Just not for the culture of Vietnam, because Vietnam runs on scooters and not on cars. So what I tell you is, culture eats technology for breakfast. It is completely wrong to just go and implement a technology based on a showcase that you see somewhere else. 
I really, really hope and I urge the Moscow government, the Murmansk, whoever is here, to come and question, relentlessly question, if you get provided with the services that your people actually need, and especially with the services that bring about the special qualities of your cities. Moscow Urban Forum provided me with a wonderful assistant, Daria, she's here today. And the first thing she told me yesterday was that Moscow is very different from St. Petersburg and there's different cultural qualities. I urge IBM and Cisco and uh, all the other panelists, Fraunhofer and, and myself at academia and banking and the governments to look into it and remember that what we will provide here should actually work for the cities we live in and not just serve our own precognition, our own ideas about how shit cities should look like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katja. Uh, yeah, this is a topic that maybe uh, if we have a, can squeeze out a few more minutes for a discussion, I would very much like to continue talking about uh, with, with the panel. Um, uh, our last but not least, our final speaker is uh, uh, Nikolai Lanze from Prince Waterhouse Cooper, who uh, also will tell us about the Data Driven Cities report that is currently presented. It includes five cities London, New York, Moscow, Barcelona, and Sydney. So, uh, this discussion is a first step in a series of such event, uh, events that uh, basically explore this uh, topic of data driven cities, cities further. Uh, please welcome uh, Nikolai. Thank you. If you don't mind, I will speech, switch to Russian. Uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to look at our research. The purpose of my presentation is to make short extract of the research results and methodology that we developed for this research. The research you can download from Urban Forum. It is also available in the printout, so please use it on Saturday. We will present a detailed presentation and discuss this report, so we invite all of you to come. As for the report itself, for the last two months we tried to understand for ourselves what's DDC, what's different between DDC and Smart City, and the results of this work is the given white paper. Methodology of research is made of two parts. The first part is the goal of research, is compare level of development of DDC concept in the leading cities of the world and also to determine key factors of success. DDC is our topic, is data-driven city. Research was made of two parts. The first part is uh, systematic research based on open data from 28 cities, that is the number of the PWC report, Cities of Opportunities report. The second module was expert assessment of five cities that already mentioned Moscow, Barcelona, London, New York, and Sydney. The first part of research, systema systematic research is made of three blocks, is press releases, media, and scientific research. What it is and why it's so important. Press release is the number of press releases published by the city authorities dedicated to new technology, dedicated to new implemented cases. In essence, this activity of city authority in disclosing research. Press and media is the specialty publications coverage. What city does is covered by the mass media. The third scientific research is how scientific community takes advantage of this solution and uh, offers new solutions. From the standpoint of the outcome, we, in both blocks, such as New York, ahead of all the planet, then goes London, and then there's Moscow, Sydney, and Barcelona, and slightly lag behind each other. When we talk about press releases, when the cities cover the events, we see Moscow number one among five cities, but three times is behind Asian countries such as Shanghai. That is amazing. They're trying to show their solutions and deliver across to the public. And the second part of research, the expert assessment, seems to me made of two parts. is technology. Technology is analysis of the cases. The solutions of which much was spoken, smart cities, smart street lights, active citizens, these are active solutions that the city authority do. We assembled more than 300 research pieces 
not research, but the cases and try to structure them. Here is the most important, what I said at first, what is the difference between a regular proposal when city hall gives access to the trams, trolleybuses movement and to data-driven solutions. For instance, active citizen conduct electronic referendum when the offer helps to get data from the citizens and make them use in solution decision making. What's the difference? Data driven, not data driven. The city authority can use them to make decisions while planning or online way. The last block is the readiness of the city is in essence collection of the key success factors. It made of three things competences competency we talk about presence of analytical centers presence of departments that in essence act as in-house consulting groups that help other functional subdivisions such as department of transport for instance the second data sources such as the sensors cameras where the city gets the data and the third is this very information infrastructure is penetration of internet cost of internet how much city uses infrastructure to maintain data-driven nature based on the results of research picture is slightly different results are more compact new york happened to be ahead next was london moscow sydney and barcelona they are pretty much on the same level so in this four minutes i was able to very briefly tell you next there is a reference to many to numerous cases i'll be glad to show them in more detail on saturday so i invite everyone thank you thank you very much for the summary um i just heard we have uh, seven more minutes that we can use for discussion and i think uh, it's uh, a lot of really interesting points came up and uh, i wanted to start with talking uh, asking our representatives of cities about some of the challenges uh, in uh, basically you know, implementing data-driven cities. We heard uh, from uh, Katja Schechtner that you know, one issue is the, that data and reality is not the same thing uh, sometimes. Uh, so, uh, but I think we're also talking about institutional uh, boundaries within cities uh, between cities and, uh, and, and, and companies and, and contractors. I uh, recently spoke to uh, an uh, official from New York who said that basically bringing city departments to share their data is like pulling teeth. So uh, some of these questions, uh, wh what have you encountered as, as obstacles and what are the lessons that you uh, can share with us for uh, dealing with them? I think that th the first point is uh, um, related uh, towards the city vision. I mean, someone, I mean, uh, the politicians are guys that step out saying, hey, you, society, I think that that's the way. Can you, do you want to follow me? The problem that we have is most of the politicians, I've been a politician for most of my life, are in a chair without nowhere to go. And there are companies thinking, without having never had the responsibility of taking a society nowhere, uh, that they have the answer for that. So that's why we need very strong, we, we need politicians with very strong visions, very open, very democratic, and at the same time with a clear vision of what has to be the organizational structure that you need to pull things forward. And then, you need the companies, but not the other way around. And the problem that we have right now is that we have companies wanting to sell, wanting to invoice things to people that don't really know where to take things to. And then there's another case, very clear for me. Uh, I don't know if that's a word. Uh, you, you know what the human genome? Um, city data is very similar nowadays to human genome. We have the data. We know that it has to be meaningful, but we don't know yet how to start using it. So we have to make sure that there's an alliance between administration, academia, and industry in order to produce meaningful tools to 
solve, and that's the third point I wanted to go to, to real problems of real people. I'm sorry, this is not about dashboards. This is not about screens. This is not about nice maps, neither nice uh, um, um, uh, graphics. It is about solving the problem of Mrs. Maria or Mrs. Natasha being 83, living alone, and we don't know whether she eats or not every day. That's a problem that we have. And big data can solve that, provided that we have a strong vision and companies want to help us. Thank you. Very good, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to also to pass on the same question to our colleagues from Prague, uh, Mr. Pachert and uh, Suska. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I couldn't agree more with our colleague from Barcelona. I think we, have, if I again uh, am uh, hopefully constructively self-critical of, of, of my city, I think we do not know how to speak to the private sector. We, we, we are sort of afraid because I think it's a matter of cultivating this sort of ongoing dialogue. We have to be able to show what where we need help, to show our weak spots, basically, and, and somehow invite the companies together with us to, to uh, help them understand what they can do for us, meaning for the city, how they can maybe uh, change their product line or enhance it or, or, or make it customized for the needs of the city, not the other way around where the, where the companies chunk their products uh, and are aggressive in selling it. So I think it's a different type of relationship that needs to be uh, said. I think from the, from the cities that we have been able to visit and where this triple or quadruple helix model where the academia, research and development, uh, the, the public and private sector together with the, with, the, with the citizens found a way to coexist and continuously talk to each other uh, were the most successful ones where they not only had the processes in place where they had boards and, and, and platforms where they could exchange ideas, but they had the culture of of not carrying out a, a, a big procurement or not making a big goal or not making a, a, a big project without having this uh, 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 sort of uh, um, uh, exception from all these sides. So, so I think it's a matter of changing of mindset that the business have to view the city uh, differently uh, is, is the way of finding a dialogue uh, on a platform and, and uh, having a cultivation, basically culture of cooperation in this sense. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I, actually uh, I think it's also a, a very interesting uh, question to also think about, you know, companies also encounter challenges in working with public administrations. Yeah, for sure. uh, there is this, uh, I think this is an anecdote going back to the 1970s when the Rand Corporation uh, was working uh, with uh, cities like Philadelphia and New York and they were used to work with huge federal institutions, the military and so on for, for decades, but working with the city of Philadelphia was too complicated and too, too difficult for them, so uh, maybe uh, you know, some of the takeaways and questions from the perspectives of uh, companies working with the public sector. Maybe let's start with uh, um, geovation. Yeah. And then we can it's a particular one about experimentation, actually, and something we talked about, and it was interesting that, that, that my colleagues from Prague were saying, is how important it is to allow people to, I think, experiment. I think city authorities have a huge responsibility, budgetary, particularly in the current environment, to, to not waste money. But you can't, you can't innovate successfully. We had this in our last session earlier on this morning. You can't innovate successfully without experimentation, mm -hmm. having the, the environment, the place, the capability to take ideas and actually test them out. So talk about the hackathons, the, 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 the opening things up so people can play with stuff. Um, because you say how you engage and how you go from a pilot through to delivery needs to start with multiple iterations and perhaps for organizations like which are selling larger offers, you know, how is that broken down in such a way that it makes it palatable to demonstrate success, to provide that roadmap, if you like, from, from early proof of concept right through to that. I mean, Marcus, you've probably done a lot of this, right? Thank you. Um, any other? Oh, yes. Um, um, okay. I would really like to thank Katya for the comment because, uh, I mean, we get this a lot as Fraunhofer. We work with uh, hundreds of, of private companies. And, and I feel that the private sector is really ready and, and, and is, is ready to unlock this amazing potential that technologies um, allow cities to, to, to become better. What, what we have seen lagging behind is, is the cities uh, not being able to decide what they want to do. And I think it's really important 
um, often to, to understand uh, the pressure that the city is experiencing and also the role of academia and the public. And, and I think there is this global phenomenon called participation. And, and I think we should, really, uh, we should really get the public more involved. And, and that's what we've been trying to do in, in more of our projects. Um, but uh, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to comment this, this uh, presentation because I think it's our role as, as, as consultants or mediators uh, in this environment uh, to first understand the needs of the city uh, that, and, 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 and propose such solutions uh, that will inevitably lead to the improvement of the overall quality of life uh, of, of the people who really use it. And whether it's, it's tourists, whether it's the, the grandmother on the, on the fifth floor that doesn't have an elevator, or whether it's a, it's a mom with a kid. Um, and I think uh, it's really understanding the detail that will help you resolve uh, a complex issue on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I just uh, got the sign that our time is up. Uh, maybe, Katya, if you have, because you raised your hand, uh, a very short okay. final statement. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would like to thank the whole panel. Uh, this was a very dense and uh, rich uh, presentation. Uh, you know, rarely that you see such a cross-cutting perspective on all kinds of, you know, uh, initiatives across the world. Uh, so I'm very glad that I could be part of that. Thank you. One small statement, as you have them here, I used, usually urge to uh, include more catalysts or catalysts into the projects, both from the company side and both from the city side. And you have here today Usman Hawk, Adam Greenfield, Dietmar, uh, Anthony Townsend, who, is, who are exactly prepared to fulfill this role between the governments and the companies and uh, the citizens to bring them together. Uh, they'll ask pesky questions, but probably we help you deliver better services and make more money too. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Can we make one point? Of course. <laughs>